Hello and welcome to the fourth Dad Village Symphony Orchestra program. My name is Jordan Holloway. I'm the director of the DVSO and I'm really, really thrilled to be able to share this music with you. Over the last three years, we've worked with nine living composers to bring new music to life, premiering nine new original works and two new orchestrations of piano works by composers who are no longer with us. We've brought together over 90 musicians from seven different countries, all of course virtually, and we plan to do much more. There is an incalculable amount of work that goes into this, not just from me, but from our performers, from the other composers who write all of this great music, from Jonathan Golly, who has helped us with the mastering of all four of our programs. And so I just want to say thank you very, very much for being here to experience the product of that work. I will never be able to communicate how much it means to me. I don't want to take too much time here, but I did want to tell you about tonight's program, Fabled. This is a program of music that tells stories. Music can tell stories in lots of different ways, some more concrete and literal than others. Music with words, for instance, so operas, musicals, even songs. These things can, if they so desire, communicate in a very literal way. Of course, not all music with words necessarily does communicate in a literal way, but it has the capacity for it. Other kinds of music, though they may be telling a story and still be narrative driven, can at times be much more abstract. If you've seen our previous performances, you need only think back to stages to find a great example of abstract storytelling in music. The listener doesn't necessarily know the details of the story, but can supplement with their own. Tonight's program sits somewhere in between those two ideas, as some of you may have picked up on from the piece we just heard, A Dash for the Timber. Ernesto Aguirre is predominantly a film composer. In film music, the details of the stories that the music is supporting can come through quite vividly, but the music is not necessarily compelled to explain everything. That's what the film itself is for. When we strip away the film, though, and are just left with the music, the details and the structure of the narrative still often remain, and we get to experience it in a completely different way. And this has, of course, led to film music not just being something that exists to support films, but instead it's an entire family of full-fledged genres. The DVSO had the privilege of commissioning a piece from Ernesto a few summers ago, and the result of that is the centerpiece of tonight's concert, Theseus and the Minotaur. My intent with this commission, knowing Ernesto's film-based background, knowing some of the composers he's inspired by, Danny Elfman, John Williams, uh, Alan Silvestri, I wanted a large-scale orchestral work that valued storytelling in the way that that great film music does, and in my opinion, that's exactly what we got. I could not be more pleased with the music that Ernesto has written for us, so I want to just give him a very special thank you for giving us a reason to have this performance. Ernesto will tell you more about Theseus and the Minotaur, but before that you'll actually hear a piece of mine. Pacifica is meant to depict a voyage across the sea. The listener starts at the shore and sets sail. And from there, it's a lot less literal, but a lot of the music is meant to depict the push and pull of the waves. There are moments where the music is quite calm and serene, and others where it's quite joyful and exciting, and it ends with the sun setting over the blue horizon. I wrote it in 2017 during my first semester of my freshman year of college, and by some miracle of God, I actually still quite like it. So. I hope you like it too. I want to give another thank you in particular to Ernesto Aguirre, Grace Stringfellow, Ariel Flack, and Jonathan Gali for helping me bring this project to life. And of course, another thank you to the 50 musicians who have spent the time learning and recording this music. This is completely impossible without them. And that's it from me. Again, thank you so much for being here. I love Dad Village.
Hi, my name is Ernesto Aguirre, and thanks so much for checking out Fabled, the latest program from the Dad Village Symphony Orchestra. The piece you heard at the beginning, A Dash for the Timber, I wrote initially in 2019, after I saw the painting of the same name by Frederick Remington. The painting is just so vivid and energetic, I felt compelled to write a piece of music to represent that. A year later, in early 2020, I had the opportunity to take a lesson with composer Bruce Broughton, who is very well known for his Oscar-nominated score, Silverado. So, for my first lesson, I showed up with A Dash for the Timber. And what that first lesson really showed me was how little I knew about orchestration. So, after some time taking lessons with him and learning more about orchestration on my own, I came back a few months later with the version that you hear now, and I'm happy to say that it's a much better version than the initial thing I wrote back in 2019. Now, in the summer of 2021, Jordan Holloway reached out and asked if I would be willing to write a symphony for a program for the DVSO. He said it would be around 20 minutes long for full orchestra, but I had pretty much the freedom to do whatever I wanted. This made me a bit nervous. I had never written a large piece like that that long before that had to stand on its own, but I accepted the challenge. What's important for me in my writing is to have some kind of concept to write around and especially telling a story with the music that I write. So I was thinking of what kind of story could support a piece that's 20 minutes long for full orchestra. And I thought Greek mythology. I know those stories well, I have since I was a kid, and I find them endlessly inspiring. So I settled on the story of Theseus and the Minotaur for a few reasons. Firstly, there's the hero, uh, there's a setting, there's a villain, there's a journey to be had, and this appealed to me in many ways. Firstly, Theseus represents us, all of us, the hero in our own stories. Now, in the classic tale, Theseus is sent to the island of Crete to go and defeat the Minotaur, the fearsome half-man, half-bull that has been plaguing the people for so long. The Minotaur lives in the center of this great labyrinth, a humongous maze that Theseus has to traverse. So for me, the labyrinth represented a few things the uncertainty of the future. I had one semester of college left when Jordan reached out, so there was also uncertainty in my own life of what would happen in the real world once I was done with school, or maybe the uncertainty of getting through a worldwide pandemic. Then there's the Minotaur. The Minotaur represents the obstacle in our way that we have to defeat, to conquer. So this symphony chronicles exactly that. We begin with movement one, which begins with a big, confident, strong theme for Theseus. Aesthetically, the style I wanted this to be in was sort of classic Hollywood epic films from the 1950s and 60s. So the movement begins really big and bombastically. In this movement, there are themes for the setting of the Mediterranean, uh, King Minos who sends Theseus on his journey to the island of Crete. And we also hear Theseus's theme transform a bit through the course of the movement as he sails to the island and grows to be a little uncertain of himself. That takes us into movement two. Movement two is very foggy, very murky, and very dark. This movement sort of depicts Theseus losing his mind as he goes through the labyrinth. We don't hear Theseus' theme at all in this movement. He is kind of losing himself and the audience is supposed to be losing themselves as well. The music itself is very cyclical. The themes keep recurring. The motifs keep coming back again and again, and we get the real sense of unease in this movement. By the end of the movement, Theseus finds himself in the chamber where the Minotaur lives, and that takes us into movement three, the Minotaur. Movement three is constructed like a big action sequence between Theseus and the Minotaur finally battling. There are several motifs for the Minotaur, not one specific theme, but different several fragments of themes that come together to represent different aspects of what the Minotaur is doing as it and Theseus are fighting. We do hear Theseus's theme in this movement. It is never in its grand form, but it does come in rhythmically or in fragments to sort of represent Theseus trying his best against the big beast. Ultimately, spoiler alert, Theseus bests the beast and the Minotaur goes down. Finally, as Theseus makes it out of the labyrinth, that takes us into our fourth movement, Ariadne and the return home. In the story, Ariadne is Theseus's love interest who is waiting for him outside of the labyrinth. We hear a grand, lush love theme in the style of those classic Hollywood epic films, and we return to Theseus's 
grand confident theme again. The theme continues to get transformed. It's not in its grandest, grandest form yet until finally we get to the last bit of the whole symphony, which should sound very familiar. I grew a lot as a composer and orchestrator writing this symphony and my eternal thanks go to Jordan for asking me to do this. It was really a lot of fun. Thank you to all of my loved ones for supporting me, to Bruce for helping me navigate such a large piece and all of the players who learned and recorded each of these parts, this would be nothing without you all. So thank you so, so much. And without much further ado, please enjoy my Symphony for Orchestra, Theseus and the Minotaur.